Okay. Here's where I try to convince you guys that uh, we don't have to worry about really rare Mendelian diseases because they're 10,000 10, times more common than you think. So, so what we've been doing is to use um, GTEx as a, as a way of integrating information from the transcriptome to use in understanding the relationship between gene and phenotype. So if you think about just measured gene expression, some component of measured gene expression, um, sorry, is, I must look at, uh, is there a pointer? Is completely genetically determined. Um, so clearly other factors affect gene expression, <clears throat> but, but there's a component of gene expression that is completely genetically determined. And using GTEx as a reference panel, where we have um, genes measured for transcriptome and also the genome variation measured in GTEx subjects, we can create um, SNP-based predictors of gene expression for each gene and each measured GTEx tissue. And while overall gene expression depends on both um, short-term environment, like what you ate for breakfast, and longer-term environment, like whether you exercise regularly and smoke. Um, and of course, over a lifetime, those things combine and you develop diseases and that feeds back on what we measure as gene expression. So there's a, a trait altered component that, that makes the direct comparison of measured gene expression to disease make, makes it very difficult to, to infer causality there. Um, but, but if we focused on just the genetically determined part, we essentially have a one-way arrow um, to our trait, and that's a gene-based test. So we basically impute transcript levels for each gene in each tissue and test the association of that endophenotype with disease, and that's a gene-based test um, that we have that we can do across many genes um, with, with high fidelity. So today, with the resource that GTEx is, we can assay more than 18,000 genes and show that with out-of-sample prediction, there's a correlation between the genetically predicted and the directly measured transcript levels of at least 0.2 in at least one tissue. So for, for many genes, um, they're expressed in multiple tissues, and you tend to get the best readout, the best quality predictor, in the tissues where you have the largest numbers of individuals measured um, for building your predictors. But of course, some genes are expressed in a single tissue, unless, and unless you've got a quality predictor built in that tissue, we can't really assay that gene. But today, we can assay more than 18,000 genes with, um, with good um, predictive ability, and um, and we're applying this broadly in, um, in BioView. So you guys are all familiar with the fact that Vanderbilt developed their electronic health records in the 1990s. There's this, um, the synthetic derivative is the de-identified and continuously updated, updated image of the EMR in about 2.5 million subjects now. BioView is the biobank associated with that, and we have about 215,000 subjects with DNA. Today, there's dense GWAS level genotyping at about 20,000, and exome chip data at about 36,000. But this time next year, um, we'll have 3 million subjects in the synthetic derivative, 225,000 subjects with DNA, uh, more than 120,000 subjects with dense genotyping, and thousands with whole genome or exome sequencing maybe tens of thousands, there's a lot of um, applications in progress. And so what we're doing is really what you might call, so if you've ever heard Josh Denny talk about phenome-wide association studies, that's what we're doing only at the gene level and trying to create this comprehensive gene by medical phenome catalog. And, and it really is a giant knockdown experiment where we're basically looking at the medical phenome associated with the knockdown of each gene in each tissue, 
and simultaneously an upregulation experiment when we're looking at the increased genetically predicted expression of each gene in each tissue and reading out the consequences across the medical phenome. But it's natural variation that we're using. So rather than manipulating the human organism, we're using natural variation that, that just leads us to, to express these bell-shaped curves of not just measured gene expression, but genetically predicted gene expression also. And this is really, it's a, it's a really fun playground. Um, and, and it makes BioView a really great in silico discovery engine. So the, and it, it really works. If you measure, if you count up the number of genes that each person has, where there are at least three standard deviations from the mean, um, in either direction. So that metric is actually, so Howard asked before, what's, a, what's a, a healthy genome? Well, part of a healthy genome is not being in the tails of any of these predicted expression distributions. It's a bad thing to be in the tails. In fact, the only distribution that you want to be in, in the tail, is this one, because it turns out that the number of genes where you're in the tails is significantly correlated with the number of FIWAS codes that you accumulate across a lifetime. So the, the more genes you have in the tails of distributions, the more different phenome codes you're going to accumulate across your lifetime. And you, you never want to be in the tails of these distributions. Um, bad things happen at both ends, and, and you probably think you do, you, you think you do for say intelligence, and, and you could get lucky there, and, and your kids could have regression to the mean, but, but really, do you want your kids to be as much smarter than you as they think they are? I mean, you pay for every tail that you're in. So, one way or another, you pay for every tail. So, so the, this works also, we can show with um, CRISPR-Cas, so in just the first few thousand patients that we looked at, there was a gene that we saw wa that was um, associated, the reduced predicted expression of GRIC5 was associated with many different I phenotypes in less time than it took us to, to do the analyses in the next 15,000 subjects. Um, they had it knocked out in zebrafish where you could see um, little cyclops zebrafish and, and most of the zebrafish just had smaller um, and sometimes misshaped eyes and if you, then took antibodies to the protein product of GRIC5, you could see that the protein is indeed highly expressed in the parts of the eye that generate all of these different eye phenotypes. It's highly expressed in the lens, perhaps where you have the cataract, it's highly expressed in areas that could lead to retinal detachment. It's highly expressed in cells that form the sheath around the optic nerve. So it's, it, the biology makes sense um, a, as you take it out into model systems. But what I want to talk about today is the fact that this is giving us real new insight into the continuum from Mendelian to common disease. And people have already been talking about this. So in the um, Undiagnosed Diseases Network and the Mendelian Sequencing Centers, they have already seen, for example, um, Eric Borwinkle and, and Jim Lubsky talk about the fact that the, um, some familial neuropathies, they solve, but some just have an accumulation of rare variants in multiple of the genes that have already been implicated in familial neuropathy. What I want to focus on here is more the continuum from loss of function mutations to, to deleterious alleles to just reduced um, expression, reduced genetically predicted expression of genes. And what we see across BioView is that the reduced predicted expression of Mendelian disease genes is associated with all of the phenotypes, the subphenotypes, the phenome packet, as it were, that make up that Mendelian disease. So, so here's a, a transcription factor, mutations associated with um, NFIX1 are, are associated actually with two different autosomal dominant diseases. Phenotypes associated with Marshall-Smith syndrome include accelerated bone formation in hands and feet and fracture, diminished muscle tone, breathing difficulties, so the larynx and trachea can be floppy. It, it makes um, getting 
getting the fluids appropriately um, through the system harder. There are classic face, facial features, blue sclera, um, mental and motor delays, so some, sometimes speech is absent or abnormal, intellectual disability and impairment. Soto syndrome too is also associated with um, mutations here. So again, you see some overgrowth um, in childhoods, curvature and scoliosis, facial um, features, muscle weakness, but more congenital uh, abnormalities of the kidney, heart, eyes, ears, like there can be deafness, um, benign tumors, low-grade malignancies, seizures, um, intellectual disability, behavior problems, uh, speech and language disorders, so um, ADHD, some insistence on sameness kinds of phenotypes, stuttering specifically was described, but other speech and language disorders. Um, and so what do we see across Bioview with, oh, and, and the kids are living longer now because they, they watch for the breathing difficulties and try to anticipate and do better, but it was generally the breathing difficulties that were the, um, the most serious problem that would often lead to death in childhood from the associated pneumonias um, and, and problems with the breathing. The, in GTEx, across GTEx, the gene is highly expressed in some parts of the heart, in the brain, very highly expressed in the brain, um, expressed in uh, muscle, not surprisingly than the, the weakness that's observed. Um, it turns out to be highly expressed in uterus and cervix. And, um, and so what do we see across BioView? So with reduced predicted expression just in blood, you see highly significant associations um, with uh, sort of pelvic inflammatory disease uh, in a number of ways, a number of different diagnoses of that. Um, in red are, are some of the classic features um, associated with one or the other of the syndromes. This is just in blood, but you see there's a number of other phenotypes um, that are also associated. So although uh, cardiac um, uh, congenital anomalies have been described, I didn't see anywhere that congenital anomalies of the esophagus have been described, but they're highly significantly associated. And it wouldn't be surprising in some newly diagnosed kids with this disease to see congenital anomalies of the esophagus, which if they haven't already been described, it might make it harder to recognize that this could be one of the autosomal dominant conditions associated with this gene. Some of these other conditions that we see as strongly associated would fall under the heading of outcomes. Now that these kids are living longer, what, what will happen to my child is one of the questions that gets asked. And, and it's always easier to watch for things that you know will, that kids will be at risk for as they grow up. And I think pelvic inflammatory disease is a great example of what is likely to be a problem in women who've been diagnosed with this as they get older. In other tissues, we see many of the other phenotypes. So facial weakness um, with high significance, pneumonia due to fungal infections, diseases of the larynx and vocal cords, symptoms of respiratory system. So there were a number of breathing abnormalities um, and uh, uh, breathing issues associated. You see symbolic dysfunction in speech and language disorders also associated. Um, disorders of the tympanic membrane, neural tube defects, kidney anomalies, um, and kidney disease. This had a range of significance depending on the tissue um, of 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 7. Also fractures, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 7 range. Seizures, con seizures convulsions, epilepsy again, 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 7 range. So, so essentially all of the key features of the Mendelian disease are seen in people with just genetically predicted reduced expression. But in addition, we get some insights into other congenital anomalies that might be observed. I mean, by definition, these are rare and have been fully characterized in only small numbers of individuals, right? And, um, and we get some potential insights into what can happen to the kids as they go, grow older. So we are developing a database of Mendelian disease genes and the associated phenotypes that we see in BioView now. Um, as I say, rare diseases may have been characterized, fully characterized phenotypically in just a few patients, 
And this comes back to something Stefan said yesterday about data-driven models for the range of clinical features that we can expect for a Mendelian disease. This may help solve some Mendelian diseases um, even without the sequencing. And, and of course, the need for outcomes as patients live longer is something we can also get here. Um, also creating a database of Mendelian genes in waiting because as I said, there are, even just with careful look across a couple of tissues, hundreds of genes not yet characterized as Mendelian disease genes, but where we see multiple congenital anomalies and, in, and intellectual disability and other really bad phenotypes associated with, with altered expression of the gene. This is probably one of the ways to kind of predict in advance of seeing it what de novo mutations in some of these mouse embryonic lethal genes would actually look like um, were someone to be born with it. Um, it. It's also something, you know, particularly if you're looking before a patient comes in, you can get in advance some of the phenotypes that you might want to check for to help distinguish among different diseases because this is a much deeper look at the possible phenotypes that will be seen with mutations at Mendelian disease genes. Just quickly, I want to talk a bit about an autosomal recessive uh, one as a canonical example of a, another set of Mendelian disease genes. This is a uh, zinc transporter act that leads to, in an autosomal recessive, uh, an autosomal recessive disease, acrodermatitis enteropathica, which is also associated with other phenotypes. So you have the skin phenotype, um, also associated with chronic diarrhea, gastritis, serious behavioral problems, anemia. Um, until the gene was cloned, it was fatal in early childhood. And then the gene was cloned, found to be a zinc transporter. Five days after zinc supplementation, the, the rash is clear, the diarrhea clears, the behavioral problems are reported to clear as well. And you can see where I'm going with this. Um, genes highly expressed in, uh, in colon, in intestine, highly expressed in kidney, highly expressed in brain, and people with reduced predicted expression have bad things. So that it's reported to have anemia, as I said. We see the mineral deficiency, some of the, the things associated with zinc deficiencies. We see in just, in just blood, we see the gastritis and, and others, but across other tissues, um, we get a bunch of skin conditions that are probably misdiagnosed um, because it's probably related to the same skin condition that, that you see in the Mendelian disease. But we see acute renal failure, kidney disease, um, chronic kidney failure, uh, kidney transplantation. We see primary pulmonary hypertension. You see the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's associated with other bad things. You see schizophrenia with a 10 to the minus 9 association and suicidal ideation or attempt. So the behavioral problems that you saw in the kids with the Mendelian disease are diagnosed um, as schizophrenia, and, and you see even the suicidal ideation and cerebral degeneration, which is what they have hypothesized is going on in the brain with the zinc deficiencies. So this is bad stuff, and how pissed off would you be if you knew, if this is what you had your whole life due to just reduced expression of this gene and could have taken zinc supplementation and not had? We don't recognize this as Mendelian disease because they're in adults, um, and, and they're often, so it's, it's just reduced expression of the gene. It's not necessarily apparent at birth. It comes on over time. Um, it may wax and wane some, but it's a serious thing for these, these people. So there is this continua, continuum. There are dozens of Mendelian diseases that can be treated reasonably effectively with innocuous therapies, vitamin or mineral supplementation, dietary intervention, and there will be more people with highly increased risk of diseases. So for, for some of this, it's five-fold, six-fold, eight-fold increased risk of bad things like kidney failure. Just, so just of these genes, of the ones that have innocuous therapies, then there are people who have Mendelian diseases. And so there's another whole group of people we have to go after um, and think about because there is a continuum of Mendelian to common disease. 
we don't have people with this diagnosis yet in BioView because it's one in 500,000. There are none in BioView now, but there are 5,000 patients in BioView today at high risk for the worst subtypes of this condition. 300 patients have multiple of the worst subtypes that could maybe be ameliorated with zinc supplementation. So in the big picture, there's a continuum from mouse embryonic lethal to Mendelian to other genes where we don't, um, where the coefficient of variation on the transcript level is lower here and higher up here. Yeah, nature's basically saying for Daniel's list of loss of function tolerance it doesn't matter how much or little you have. The heritability is still high, even though the coefficient of variation is low, heritability is still higher here than down here. And these contribute disproportionately to phenome burden. And the Mendelian diseases fit on the major axes of disease risk just the way the, com the other ones do, raising the possibility that at some point, rather than gene-specific, um, that we'd, we'd work on these axes, wound healing, innate immunity, TGF-beta signaling, apoptosis and growth, and, and be able to, to treat that way. So we definitely see this um, throughout with these um, predicted expression phenotypes. Um, and this was results on all genes in about 18,000 after QC from the 20,000, um, but, but we'll have much larger sample sizes as we go up and much better granularity to do this. So just then our my colleagues playing in the band with Dan now, and um, Lisa and Eric did most of the compute, and Anwar keeps the computers running. The zebrafish group, and BioView is such a fun playground. Um, and our GTEx colleagues, and the GTEx project, which is just a fantastic resource um, for doing this. So happy to take questions. So we'll, we'll take, um, because of time, we'll take one question, if there's a specific question for Gail, and then we'll go back to the general discussion. For Nancy. For, sorry, I'm looking at Gail, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy. At least you didn't call her Dan. <laughs> Dan. Uh, and I don't even have, like, the flight jet lag thing to explain this, so. Um, so we'll take one uh, question specifically for Nancy, and then we'll go into open discussion. Howard. So Nancy, um, this is the second time I've heard the talk and I really like it. Um, but as I listen to it, it makes me pause for a moment and say, so what's the, what's the spurious nature of those associated phenotypes, do you think? And how do we sort that out? Because it just, it just makes me nervous that with that one gene, that there's so many phenotypes that are, out, that are clustered around that. Um, and you've got high p-value, so I, I see that. But I, I'm just worried: is it how much? How much of it is is true? How much is false positive? And I, I and I guess how, how many of these have you checked to know to know that? Yeah. Okay. So so the the one gene that we've gotten all the way through zebrafish validated. That's a new. That was a novel observation of phenome to to gene association. But and it was one phenotype, though. So, no, no, it's multiple. It was multiple eye phenotypes. Yeah. That was why we put it into zebrafish, and and the, it's clearly that gene is clearly important for normal eye development in zebrafish, and that protein product is expressed in all of the parts of eye that affect the phenotypes in humans, the eye diseases in humans with which it was associated. The if we the conservative Bonferroni correction for the number of genes we can interrogate in the number of tissues where we get quality interrogation by the number of phenomes, phenome codes that we look at, um, is that would be about 8.3 times 10 to the minus 8 if we use a uh, um, permutation, because a lot of these phenome codes are actually correlated. It's probably more like 7 times 10 to the minus 7, but even using the 8.3 times 10 to the minus 8, there are, there are highly significant associations. The reason there were so many with these genes is that Mendelian disease genes and mouse embryonic lethals accumulate much more and much more significant phenome association than genes do on average. Believe you me, I got plenty of genes 
that have no phenome-wide significant, no, no significant associations with any phenome. And, and other of the genes that are not Mendelian, not mouse embryonic lethal, often have piddly, you know, if one crosses the threshold, you could be lucky. So it's not that all genes look like this. Mendelian genes look like this. Mouse embryonic lethal genes look like this. And in particular, the, the zinc transporter looks to be on this axis um, of a number of other genes associated with many of these same phenotypes, but it's got a much stronger effect um, because it's a Mendelian, it's more central to sort of normal health and development than most of my polygenic genes on this same sort of um, axis. So I, there's a lot of things we're learning, and one of them is that Mendelian genes are really special. They, they are central to normal growth and development and health, and messing around with those in either direction is not a good thing for human beings. And every subphenotype that makes up a Mendelian disease syndrome, you know, packet, is a common disease. I mean, many Mendelian diseases are associated with kidney failure. Kidney failure is going to be associated with a reduced expression of most of those genes because it's, but, but later onset and, um, and not in every single person with, with the low one because it'll depend on the rest of it. But you will see a lot of the same phenotypes associated with reduced expression. It's going to account for much more of medical phenome than we've ever appreciated. Okay, um, so I have, now I have lots of people here. Hang on one second. Uh, so I had Wendy and I have Leah. So, but I want to um, now move into the general discussion for this session. I want to thank Melissa and Nancy for really thought-provoking talks. Um, but I want to back up to the people that were in queue. Um, so Jose, and then Peter, and then Calum, and then Wendy, and then Leah.